Yes, welcome back to How Did I Get Here. Today we've got a very interesting guest thanks to Fremantle Press. Brooke Dunnell is a writer, mentor, workshop facilitator, editor and a podcast host as well. Uh, She was awarded the 2021 Fogarty Literary Award for her book, The Glass House. Brooke joins me today. Brooke, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Let's jump right in, starting pretty early on. When does writing first enter your life? The first thing I can think of is I wrote this book when I was about six right? and it was written and illustrated by me and it was all about a man who woke up and had no teeth and went to the teeth shop and couldn't buy any teeth and then woke <laughs> up and it was all a dream. Oh, so I was right. working with those um, twist endings from the a young age. classic twist. Yeah, yeah, but I don't know if it's apocryphal because uh, I was looking for this book recently and I can't find it, but I have this picture in my mind of the drawings I did and binding it. And <laughs> yeah, so from a very, very young age, I decided I was going to write books. Yeah. Mm. And did that continue throughout your schooling experience? Yeah, so I was talking to a friend the other day and we were remembering um, – being about seven years old or so and having having to write in journals at school and mm. we had a competition going for who could write the most pages. <laughs> so we would, you know, seven pages, nine pages. We were just trying to outdo each other. And then um, we had a uh, PC at home in the computer room, as mm. it was called then, and I remember just getting on um, Microsoft Word 98 and just – writing these stories that I think started all right and then they would just absolutely go off the rails and I would (laughs) never finish them. So, yeah, I can't remember there ever being like a break. I was always just, you know, Mm. right after school, right during school, make books with my friends. So, yeah, obsessed with it. Mm. We'd love to hear about student lives here at Student Edge. So if you could describe to us what kind of student were you? I was a complete goody (laughs) two-shoes. Teacher's pet, you know, I was the one... In the front row, you, you know how you put your hand up and someone like pushes you their have to arm. Hold your arm up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they're like, me, me, oh, and you know, they're calling on other people, like, no, I know the answer. I was, yeah, I was um, a very keen student, shall mm. we say. Um, and yeah, and I, I love school, which was lucky for me because I know a lot of kids don't, but yeah, yeah I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Especially in later years, you know, was it English and Lit that was, was the favourite subject? It was English and Lit. It was also drama. Right, yeah, Because that's also a kind of storytelling play kind of mm. thing. Um, but, yeah, English and Lit were absolute favourites. And when I was in – I don't know if they still do it these days, but when I was in um, doing Year 11 and 12, you could only do English or English Lit to count yeah, towards uni. They still mm. do that. And I really considered just doing both because I just wanted to, mm. but I wasn't that much of a nerd, so I didn't <laughs> do both. I did only do Lit, but, yeah, um, yeah, absolute favourite subjects all the way through. So, yeah, not much variation there. It, on the other side of the coin, was there a least favourite subject? Oh, it would have to be – it started off as sport yeah. because I was just not – I was not into, you know, changing and having mm. to – and I'm, I'm not good at it, not very <laughs> athletic kind of person. And then a couple of the science subjects, like things like physics and chemistry, I just could not get my brain around. So um, could appreciate them from afar, but, yeah, they were, they were not my bag. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, one of the most important parts of being a writer is reading. Oh, yeah. What kind of books did you read as a young person? What inspired you? Oh, everything that was in the house, basically. So mm. I was, you know, if it, if it was my choice, it would be first choice babysitter's club all right. the time. Yeah. yeah. Um, wanted to be Claudia because she had a phone in her room and ate junk food. So she was amazing. <laughs> um, Living the life, yeah. Yeah, she was so good. And then, yeah. I mean, any books that I got from the um, from the kind of middle grade readers kind of section at the library. Mm. Um, but then if I was bored, I'd just raid my parents' bookshelves. So I was reading like Reader's Digest. I was reading weird joke books that I didn't get half <laughs> the jokes in. I would read my brother's books like Goosebumps and I'd just basically if I had any downtime, mm. I just wanted to be reading something like it read the newspaper, read the back of the cereal box at breakfast time. Like <laughs> I'm, I'm probably lucky that we didn't have phones back then because I would have just been looking at my phone. <laughs> but it was the, yeah, it was the um, 90s equivalent of, mm. yeah, staring at your phone. Do you think that breadth of reading, you know, all those different stuff you've described, is that really helped you as a writer today? I would like to think so, mm. yeah. I mean, you never know, do you? You don't course, know yeah. what kind of writer you would be otherwise. I definitely, um, like I said, I had my favourites and the things that I would prefer to be reading if it were my choice. And not that I write Babysitter's Club stuff today, but I think that <laughs> idea of, you know, friendships and um, 
and relationships and contemporary life and things like that has always mm. been what really interested me, um, even though I would read anything, basically. Of course. Yeah. So leaving high school, you know, was it always your dream and your plan to be a writer? Was there any other aspirations? I think it was probably a dream more than a plan. Right. Because I wasn't so much ever – I don't remember ever being told, oh, you, you know, you won't be a writer, you have to get a real job or something like that. Of course. Not being told that directly anyway. And as I've kind of said to um, – realised a bit recently, my grandmother's sister, so my great aunt, she was actually a writer. She wrote mostly um, biographies and children's books. And my grandma had all her books in the house. So to me, you could be a writer because my great aunt was a writer. So it wasn't that far off. But I remember being like, well, you know, you go to uni and you don't really do a uni degree in being a writer. No. <laughs> you yeah. do adjacent yeah. stuff. So I think I kind of got the idea that, well, you can't just go out and, and be, say, a novelist immediately or mm. something like that. So I did end up... Um, enrolling in a journalism degree and that was probably well it was because I liked writing but people would say oh you like writing you should be a journalist and I was like oh that makes sense yeah so yeah yeah, so that was what I ended up doing and I think probably I had some idea that oh well I'll be a journalist and then I'll be a writer like Mm. you know it's that seems like a pretty straightforward career path so (laughs) yeah I think I think that might have been what I was thinking but I think I was also just kind of doing what you you do, you know, you listen to advice and you end up doing a uni course that sounds like the kind of thing that you might like and then yeah. either you're lucky enough that it's the, the thing that you dream of and it ends up being your career or you do five uni courses until you find something or you don't do uni at all or whatever. You just have to kind of, yeah, fumble your way through, I suppose. Yeah. I was curious about this. What was your first ever job? Oh, my f- – well, my first ever job was – Vacuuming the house for eight dollars a week. <laughs> eight dollars a week. That's eight dollars a week. It wasn't bad. It was because um, my brothers had um, paper rounds, and I wasn't allowed to because my parents decided it wasn't the greatest idea for an eleven-year-old girl to be walking around um, mm. in the late evening. So, um, yeah. So that was the first job, and then the first um, job, job in inverted commas was I was a checkout chick at Coles. Classic. Yeah, yeah. How are you today? <laughs> Do you have flybys? <laughs> See you later. All that stuff. Yeah. I'm wondering if you can tell me the story of your first ever published piece. What was it? That's a really good question because it makes me think. I think it was, I'm probably getting slight details of this wrong, but there used to be a competition called the West Australian Young Writers Competition. Mm -hmm. I think it might have evolved into the Tim Winton and now recently Craig Sylvie writing competition. I think that might be wrong. But um, I... I think it was in year 12, I came, I placed in that, can't remember what place it was, and it was in the paper, the story was in the paper. So, um, yeah, I think I think that was probably it. That's the thing that comes to mind, apart from obviously my story with, about the man with no teeth. <laughs> that, was, that didn't go to a wider audience, but yeah, um, so I, th- yeah, I think it was that, and it was, so it was a short story, and it was, they, the ones that got um, prizes ended up being in the paper, mm. I think, yeah. We had another writer on a f- few weeks ago, Mark McKenzie Murray, and he spoke about that first time and seeing the thrill of the byline. Yeah. Did, you, did you experience that? I mean, I feel like I must have done. Yeah. But it's not, I wish I had a better story for this because it's the kind of thing that you should be able to, um, <laughs> that, that should, you know, stick in your mind. I think, I mean, I think, I, I don't know if it was the byline so much, but I do remember the award ceremony and them saying my name. So mm. maybe that was the bit that kind of, of course, sticks yeah. out. Because I remember also my mum came with me and she squealed and I said, shush mum, don't embarrass <laughs> me. And then I got up and, you know, got my certificate and things like that. So, um, yeah, that was definitely a memorable experience. Yeah. Mm. Before we do get to The Glass House, yep. which is your novel, mm. um, you did have some late um, – earlier publications I should say is there a special one for you that kind of set you on a course oh that's a great question as well um I think it was probably it was probably two stories so they again there used to be a collection every year called best Australian stories which Mm. was um they'd have a guest editor every year who would be a writer themselves and they would mostly choose short stories that were published in journals and things like that 
but then also they'd sometimes add in a few that weren't published elsewhere. And in 2009, I got a story in that that um, that wasn't uh, hadn't been published elsewhere, so it, it just got picked up by itself, which I was quite thrilled by. And then a few years later, um, I had a story that was published in a magazine, a, a Melbourne magazine, that they actually chose. So when I got the letter saying, oh, you know, your story that was in this this journal, we would like to publish in Best Australian Stories, I think that was the moment where I was like, oh, this might be, you mm. know, something that I can do and, and stand out a little bit. And uh, that second story especially, I really liked it as well. Yeah. But, you know, because um, you don't always – Probably the other writers you've talked to have talked about this, but you don't always like everything that you write. <laughs> yeah, and exactly. Yeah. yeah, and this one I was quite chuffed by. So to have that recognition from, you know, the Best Australian Stories editor saying, yeah, we like it too and we would like to republish it, which doesn't always happen. Mm. Um, I think that's probably the one that sticks out in my mind thinking that, oh, yeah, this this could be a good thing. Yeah. Mm. Now, onto the Glass House. That was the manuscript that won you the 2021 Fogarty Literary Award. Yeah. Can you tell me about the inception of this one? Where did it come from? So it came from a few different places. So mm. I'd had this idea um, for a while that it, the original version of the idea was um, a woman who uh, is kind of dealing with her childhood and, and um, the loss of a parent um, whilst facing the breakup of her marriage. So that's kind of like this broad generalisation for the the. Um, genesis of the idea the original version of it that I wrote was really that was basically all that was happening and it was very stagnant because Mm. um, the the female character's parent had died and her marriage she was divorced so everything had finished and she was just looking back and so I kind of tried to get that manuscript out there and um, it didn't really go anywhere and I kind of thought later oh it's because nothing really happens in it so then I kind of had a very similar idea that was um, a bit tweaked but I think had a little bit more action in it, which was having – so in the glass house, the character's father, he's still alive but he needs to be moved into aged care. Yeah. And um, the character's husband, they're having, excuse me, a bad spot in their marriage but they're not actually divorced. So there was this actual potential for her to bounce off those two characters and then a couple of the other storylines kind of came from other ideas I'd had, which was like um, having a, a, a friend who um, you used to be friends with when you were kids who kind of comes back into your life when you're an adult, but she might have mm-hmm. kind of nefarious kind of plans and stuff. And also um, this idea of having kind of creepy dreams about something that might be happening to someone you love. So they were kind of three separate ideas and when I realised, oh, something needs to actually happen in this manuscript, I kind of blended them together, um, which I think was lucky that they worked because that's not always guaranteed to work. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. I think as I was writing that draft, the first draft of, of what was um, became The Glass House, I kind of felt more there was more of an energy to it than there had been to the other one and to other things that I'd written in the past. Mm. Now, of course, it's primarily set here in Perth. Yeah. Uh, is there biography to it? I think... I, I've definitely mined things like places and um, details from my childhood. So none of, none of the things that happen in the book actually happened to me. Mm. Um, and it's not – so I grew up in Williton. Yeah. It's not technically set in Williton. It's not actually said where it's set, but it is in that general area, but closer to the river probably. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the houses in it, it's kind of um, – the exterior of the house is kind of my childhood house, but the interior is kind of more my grandparents' house. And then the interior of another house is um, my best friend's right. childhood yeah. house. <laughs> yeah, that kind of thing. So all these things are kind of picked from details that happened when I was a kid, but the the um, the events that happen in it are completely made up. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. A lot of writers, you know, they talk about their own processes and rituals. Oh, yeah. Do you yeah. have anything that works for you as a writer or is it just sitting in front of a computer? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's probably – it's it's hard because um, – also because I do a lot of teaching now, people mm. will ask, you know, what's your practice because they'd like advice, they'd like to see how to make it work. And I do kind of feel a bit bad because I'm not very routine-driven. Mm-hmm. I kind of am better – when I'm in the middle of writing something – if I do a little bit of writing every day and I try to do maybe 2,000 words, 2,000 words every day, but apart from that, my my discipline is not very good. And I think it's more the excitement and I think that the, um, 
one of the best things that works for me is actually leaving the writing at a bit that I'm still excited about that's not quite finished because then I'll be really excited to go back to it the next day, whereas the times when I finish on like a chapter or something and I don't really know what's going to happen next, it's a lot harder the next day. Mm -hmm. Um, But I know, yeah, other people, some people will be, you know, I always get up at 5 a.m. or I always write at midnight or, you know, I can't, I, I always sit there for an hour or something like that and I think, I always just say to people, you just got to figure out what's going to work for you. It's not going to be the same as other people. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, you know, speaking of the actual process and coming up with the book. Yeah. P- before The Glass House, you were primarily a short story writer. Yeah. What was the switch to a novel like? Well, the thing was that I was a published short story writer, but right. I was a novel writer who was not published. <laughs> so <laughs> um, it wasn't as hard as... Um, it probably would have been if I hadn't tried writing a manuscript, a novel-length manuscript before. Um, but you do – they are always um, different and the main thing, you know, it's probably quite obvious, but it is really hard to keep the whole of a novel idea in your head. So thinking about, you know, being able to remember the beginning, the middle, the end, the different, you know, flashbacks, different characters and stuff – I always need lots more notes for that mm. and need – it's a lot more stamina. It's kind of that like marathon, not a sprint kind of thing. Whereas um, a short story you can do, like hold it all in your head at once, kind of maybe do it all, you know, quite quickly, things like that. But I think I, I personally just go by the idea, like if an idea kind of um, seeps into my head, I can kind of figure out how much, you know, content it's got. Is it just a kind of a – a flash of meaning where it's probably going to be a short story or is it something that's extended and, and got kind of multiple directions it goes in? It's probably more a manuscript idea. Mm. Yeah. Now, from my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. but, you know, you've got the manuscript but it's not quite finished yeah. and you do turn it around quite quickly to meet the deadline for yeah. the Fogarty. Can you tell us the story <laughs> of the submission? <laughs> so um, I probably started writing um, – the, the proper version of what was going to be the glass house, I would say, in the middle of 2020, mm-hmm. I think. So, um, and the Fogarty submission deadline was April the 18th, um, 2021. And it's a competition for writers who are aged under 35. And so my 35th birthday was April the 25th, <laughs> 2021. So I was going to be 34 years, 11 months and three weeks old. <laughs> but um, so I was very uh, motivated by it because – it was going to be the last time I could enter because mm. they run it every two years. So I was certainly going to be, you know, I'm almost 37 now um, yeah, when it's yeah. when it's going to finish up. And I, I pretty much thought, you know, nine months out or so, I was like, I think if I really give myself a schedule and focus on this, I can get it done and I can share it with some writing friends who I like to get feedback from. Yeah, That didn't end up quite working. Um, I did – kind of talk to them in general about what I was doing, but I didn't end up having the time to show them things I was worried about and get get feedback from them. Um, and so I ended up submitting on April the 18th, 2021, day, yeah. the very last day. I think they've reassured me that I wasn't literally the last entrant, <laughs> but I was definitely up there. one of, yeah, one of the very last entrants. Um, but it was, you know, it was, mm. it was still open, so an open... An Counts, open, yeah. yeah, an opening is an opening. And um, and then, you know, lucky for me, it was only a few weeks until they actually rang up and said, oh, yeah, you've been shortlisted. So I had very little time to kind of stress out and, and freak out about it. Mm. Leads into my next question. You know, yeah. you get the call, you are shortlisted. Yeah. There's $20,000 in a publishing contract on the line. Yeah. What's going through your head, especially as you get that call? Yeah. Um, well, first, so I missed the call because oh, right. I was with a friend. And so and <laughs> I like to Google who's called me that I don't know, <laughs> the, the number I don't know that doesn't look like a scam number. And so when it kind of came up as a Fremantle Press number, I thought, oh, I don't <laughs> think they're going to be calling to say thanks but no thanks. But I did think oh, I might be long listed or something, yeah. which is when, and I thought they might just tell me, oh, it was good and, you know, um, but that it wouldn't go any further. And so, but when I, I got, I did ring back um Claire and George's voices were so excited. I was like, oh, this is, you know, maybe something good has happened. So, um, yeah, so they said I was shortlisted. I think they did say that there were three of us who were shortlisted and they said, you know, this is when the event's going to be, It's these are the things you need to do. And because they'd done the Fogarty 
two years before mm. um, and I knew about it, I kind of thought because they had – so the previous one, um, all of the shortlistees had been published. Right. So you did, they're not only the winner. So I kind of thought – you know, I mean, it would be just my luck that I was the only shortlisted not to be published, but I thought this might be okay even if I don't win. Mm. I might actually get published by Fremantle or get advice from Fremantle or just make connections or something. So I was actually quite positive about it because I thought, oh, I won't win, but it'll be okay because, yeah. you know, because I will have formed a relationship with Fremantle. So um, I basically just told myself, or well, was just convinced for the next, I think it was a few weeks. Anyway, however long until the awards night, um, that it wasn't going to be me and that was going to be okay because I, th- I didn't think it would just drop away into nothing. Um, and then when they said my name, I was absolutely <laughs> flabbergasted because I told myself it was not going to be me. And then, mm. um, yeah, twenty thousand dollars isn't bad, so that was, no, that not was bad. pretty good news. Yeah, yeah. So you, like that was my next question. You yeah. didn't think you were in with a chance at all, or you know, a I little don't, inkling? I don't know. Uh, I think. Do you know? I I was sure it wasn't going to be me. Yeah. Until they said the winner is, and then in that silence, I suddenly thought, "Are they going to say my name?" I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know if maybe her voice was forming a but at the other two. <laughs> you know, their names didn't begin with that. But I thought, "Oh, they're going to say my name," and then they did. Mm. And um, I don't I don't know whether it was that I didn't think I was in with a chance. I just thought, "Oh, I won't be lucky enough." Mm. But that's okay. You know, because because I thought it it would be a good outcome anyway. It didn't really stress me out to think, mm. oh, what if I win? What if I don't? Because I thought it, you know, as once I was shortlisted, that that was the good thing. Mm. Yeah, I remember I've I've spoken to a few people who won big awards like yeah. that, and I've heard this story a few times. You know, your your name gets read out, and everything just goes blank. Yeah, you know, and you're walking up to stage, something's taken you up stage, but you don't know. Is that something that you felt? Um, I th- I think I was like, I need to act normal and I need to not regret <laughs> kind of, you know, not trip over myself. One or, foot in front of the other. So, yeah, like. <laughs> yeah. So I remember getting up very carefully, laying out my speech very carefully, trying to speak very slowly. So I think I was kind of like hyper-conscious of this is the point at which people do weird things, you know. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, uh, yeah, I just was – it, it is a bit of a blur, I think, mm. but I think the main thing that I can think of is me going, be cool, be cool. <laughs> <laughs> Never been cool in my life, but be cool now, you know, mm. yeah. Of course then, so you win the award, mm. the next step is actually publishing the book. Yeah. So I think it's then 2022, late 2022, the book actually does get published. So yeah. it's a fair while between those two events. Yeah, it's what 19 was, months. Yeah. yeah, what was that experience like for you? Um, it was when they kind of said, I can't remember if they said on the night or if they said, if I'd known or whatever. Anyway, once I learned it was November, I did think, it, I knew that publishing was a long process. Mm. I thought, oh, that's quite long. Um, but that's okay. Uh, the, the editing process itself was really, really good because Georgia, who was my editor, she is brilliant. And all the people you talk to will say that she's brilliant. And so it was a really interesting process where she would give these suggestions or say, you know, this kind of reads like this or what if, what if you expanded this kind of bit? And um, I'd always think, oh, yeah, that's a great idea, you know. So it was just this process where you felt like she was really helping. Um, and so, yeah, we went back and forth a little bit on that. There were obviously – there's a few hiccups, you know. Mm. Um, I think there was a little bit of um, – uh, took a while longer to get the the cover page than they kind of maybe had hoped and yeah. stuff like that. And so some things you're kind of waiting around for ages and then suddenly something happens very quickly. But it was really, really interesting because I, I felt like I knew a little bit about publishing and I knew Australian publishing is different from English publishing, American publishing, things like that. But just being able to see how it gets done was just really fascinating. But then there is this really long um, kind of empty period when – they're like, oh, it's all it's all set up, but then the book doesn't come out mm. for a lot more months after that. So yeah. it's just it's just really um, kind of an interesting, strange kind of process. Mm. Yeah. When you got the first copy of the book, <laughs> what did that feel like? Um, I didn't cry. I probably <laughs> should have, but um, it just 
Yeah, I think, um, again, I think the thing for me was seeing the cover for the first time. So not when it, it wasn't necessarily a physical copy, but when they said this is the one that we're picking, um, that was when I kind of thought, oh, my book is a real book. You mm. know, it's got a it's got a face on it, basically. <laughs> not that it's a face, it's a, it's a head, but anyway. Um, and, yeah, it's just kind of... I mean, it's probably a, a cliched term, but it's, it is surreal. It's kind of weird that you're like, oh, I, I made this thing and other people are going to see this thing and they're, yeah. they're going to have opinions on it and, and things like that and I can hold it in my hand and just all, all those kinds of things that is very different from having digital words on a computer. Of course. Having it, yeah, mm. on a bookshelf. Yeah. What's next for you as a writer? Um. Well, I have written another book. Oh. Yeah, and it's going to be published next year. So that's very exciting. Um, I'm looking forward to doing the editing process again. Mm. Um, got a few events and things like that, teaching and stuff. But um, one of the main things I'm excited about is that they've actually asked me to be one of the judges of the Fogarty of Literary Award that's coming up. So that's going to be so exciting to see mm. what comes in and, and the um, the manuscripts that are going to be the most exciting and have the most potential that's going to be really, really interesting. Mm. Yeah, That's my next question. You know, Mm. you you are judging this year's award. Is there anything you're looking out for? Like what do you look for in good writing? I think it's something that just makes you dying to know what happens next. Yeah. And also really enjoying the process of – absorbing the words because sometimes you'll read something where you're either kind of eh, on the writing or you're a bit annoyed by the writing but you're like oh just I'll flip to the end because I want to know what's going to happen mm. so I'm hoping for that kind of mixture where you're just enjoying it so much but also you just want to know what the writer's going to do with these characters they've created and the scenarios they've created and so that could be a range of genres you know from creative non-fiction it could be genre fiction it could be literary fiction a good story is a good story so is there any advice that you might have for aspiring writers or for young people who might think be thinking about entering this year's award? I would – my first advice would be that if you think it's something that you would like to do that interests you, you should definitely give it a try because you never know, you know, what you've got until you've actually got it, mm. got it down. Um, I would suggest that uh, – Maybe trying to get it in the day before the deadline might be a good (laughs) idea for them. I don't know. I mean, like I said, a deadline's a deadline. Um, But I I just always think just because there's not that many opportunities Mm. to have, um, you know, publishers and editors and and other writers and stuff read your manuscripts because with a competition everything's going to get looked at. Whereas, you know, when you send – you send manuscripts to, to publishers kind of on spec, you don't really know what's going to happen to it. So this idea that you could, you know, it's it's for young writers so there's automatically um, not going to be eligible to everyone so you've got this, this chance that you might not get in other competitions. Um, you can get it in front of a, a, a real publisher, you've got this chance to win money, get it published, get it looked at, meet other people. You know, it's it's just um, it's just definitely something that you, you should try but also proofread, proofreading <laughs> is always good as well if you've only got, you know, um, not all the, all the time in the world, um, do try and, and proofread it and mm. just – and also, you know, that's, that's kind of more technical advice but um, probably more – general and useful advice is to trust your voice because I think um, another Fremantle writer, David Wish Wilson, said this to me, which I thought was really good. So he teaches at Curtin and he said that often he finds people feel like, you know, oh, living in Perth and and having a kind of contemporary existence isn't worth writing about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you might not want to write about your kind of own life. You might want to write um, about history or about space or whatever but whatever you want to say is worth being heard you know mm. you don't need to mimic other people or think that that your the the ideas you come up with aren't worth it so kind of if you if you trust yourself and you kind of lean into your voice and and give yourself that opportunity I think that's really the best you can do for yourself mm. yeah before I do let you go Brooke mm. a couple of reflections uh, that we ask everyone here on the show you know reflecting on your career so far is yeah. there anything you'd change along the way 
Interesting. Mm. Um, I probably would have submitted to the Fogarty before the, the last day so that I didn't have to admit to everyone that I'd done it. <laughs> um, I don't know. I kind of – there was a period of time that I wasn't writing very much mm. and, you know, everything – happens the way it needs to happen but now I wish I kind of had I I think I was a little bit you know disillusioned and stuff and I kind of just wish that I'd not had that lull because um looking back it didn't really do me any good and so Mm. um I think I I probably would have wished that I would have kept it up a little bit more and, and been a little bit more consistent with it at the time um but I think basically everything else I've done has all you know you end up in this place because of the things you did. So if, if I changed something, maybe I would have ended up in a worse place. So it's probably safer to to just go with what I've just got, go you know. Yeah. yeah. And finally, a hypothetical we like to give on the show uh-huh. is, you know, your 15-year-old self is sitting in front of you. What advice are you giving her? Um, oh, I think – I don't know what I would have liked to hear when I was 15. Um, I probably would tell her that – you can be a writer and you can be a novelist and, mm. you know, and, and that that's possible. And I think I probably would say to her, it's all right that you're a bit of a nerd, <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> and that you didn't really risk too much because you came out of it all right. Like I don't yeah. have regrets that I was that kid at the front of the room putting their <laughs> hand up and things like that. And I probably, I probably would say to her though, oh, this is – the stupidest thing ever, but I probably would have said to it, yeah, just do English and English lit because when you try and do chemistry, you're not going to like it anyway, <laughs> so you might as well do English. Um, not that that would have changed her life, but, you know, I think she would have been happy to get that advice. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. That about wraps it up here for How Did I Get Here Today. You can find us, student underscore edge on Instagram, student edge on TikTok. Search us up, student edge on YouTube or How Did I Get Here and head to studentedge.org for all our articles, podcasts, deals, competitions, career tips, education advice and much, much more. Brooke, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me.